it's one of the best things that Virgil told me. He was like, if essentially you don't tell your own story, somebody else will tell it for you. So you have yeah. to be able to de essentially define yourself and be able to control the narrative. I'm Nike Master Trainer Joe Holder. I'm here to help you take your fitness to the next level through athletic base strength and conditioning. My philosophy is how do you use small chunks of time that will then uh, improve the next big chunk, right? So that 20 minutes in the morning can make the next six to seven hours of your day back. You cannot tell me that you don't have time for that. Naomi Campbell gave you an opportunity. Virgil Abloh gave you an opportunity. Bella Hadid gave you an opportunity. So what were you doing that they gave you the opportunity? What do you think they saw? Yeah, I mean, good question. I mean, I was fucking grinding. The only person I really looked up to was Virgil. He's the only person I would ever thought of working for. I'm curious, why Virgil? What was it about him that stood out? Uh, I mean, he just... Before we get into the video, YouTube analytics say that 90% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. If you want to see even bigger guests, better conversations, please subscribe. It really helps us grow the podcast. And with that, onto the video. So, Callum Johnson Show. We have Joe Holder on the pod. Joe, welcome to the show, man. What's up, bro? Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Man, nah, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, it's interesting as well because um, like I've been following you on Twitter for like over a year. So I was like paying Twitter's attention. Twitter's the real me, to be honest. <laughs> That's the authentic. Twitter. <laughs> That's where the skeletons are buried on Twitter, I feel like. <laughs> nah, I deleted the old tweets. I just, let the, I just let the new muscle out on Twitter. Yeah, you know what, actually? Um, oh, there was something that you tweeted out uh back end of last year and i wanted to ask you about it a, f a funny thing about this podcast like even when i'm preparing i think to myself i'm like i always i want to start the episodes with like energy <laughs> like i want people to like come in question one they're like oh like they ain't fucking around like, they, they're going <laughs> at it thanks um so let me read let me read you this tweet that you wrote and then i can get your live reaction this episode is brought to you by free agency if you want to take your career to the next level, Free Agency is a company that you should check out. They manage and represent talent in the tech industry, and they provide you with a dedicated talent agent to help you find, engage, and win top of market roles that will maximize your earning potential. No more leaving money on the table. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with Free Agency. Anyway, back to the show. So kind of just want to give it all up and open up a healthy bodega. <laughs> That has a library, but at night it flips into a speakeasy. Yeah, I mean, would I do it? I mean, maybe when I get some more money, but I've always been, yeah, I've always been intrigued by the concept of called like third places and spaces. Uh, you know, it's this concept by sociologist Ray Oldenburg where he looked at, I study sociology, it just fascinates me. I minored in psychology and marketing and concentrated in health and medicine. So I just like the integration of all those worlds. And, you know, you see the increasing in social clubs and these things like that, but and not a lot of spaces that are either flex or more kind of democratic or meritocratic. And yeah, that thought was, was just like, there's things that seem to just be able to meld into each other that just aren't done. Mm. And, you know, my late buddy uh, Virgil always talked about how he wanted to open up a jazz club. And I always just love that idea. He used to riff about it, but I've always just thought about the need for improved brick and mortar spaces that just allow people to participate. And, you know, it's all there. It's it's like healthy bodega, has a good time, it flips, you can still drink a little bit or not drink or whatever you want to do. Uh, but I'm just fascinated by fostering infrastructures for participation. But I think first, wanted to figure out that thought process and really build it in a digital age that then shifts, not necessarily that idea, but I'm interested more so right now in digital real estate. How do I foster community on the internet? And, um, and then from there, you know, utilizing existing infrastructures off the ground to continue to pursue health. Hmm. Hmm. You know what? You say like, um, there was a lot that you said there. And I think it's like important to like key into it. You said uh, fostering infrastructure for participation. Yeah. Health what is a service industry, right? So it's, is at the end of the day why apps work is that you have a quantifiable ecosystem that helps people participate towards their health goals, but it's often just been A to B instead of kind of a top down approach where say I just say something out, then you do it, and then you got to figure out a way to then show your participation within that said ecosystem instead of more so can you do it whatever Reddit style or this is why Web3 becomes interesting and some of the work that Ty Haney is doing in the space. 
is that how do we create these infrastructures that allow your participation? So you're participating with a peer group a pair group as you go towards as you go towards some sort of health attainment goal so that's how i look at it it's i look at it as design it's like at the end of the day the stuff is played out whether it's jenny craig whether it's weight watchers and they're trying to rebrand whatever but you know there's a reason why weight watchers new ceo or whoever they put in charge was you know really responsible for 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 fostering community in their old job and i think that's just what's missing in the new new age now mm -hmm. The question becomes the old stuff the old style was doing what it was opening up brick and mortar shops but one i don't want to do that everybody who i know for the most part does brick and mortar spaces are just miserable or they're stressed out right i don't want to be do that and then i don't i'm not really solving a problem because unless you're there you can't participate so then the question becomes how do you use the digital ecosystem to then be able to do that and that's yeah, that's really my focus for the next two plus years is consolidating my thought leadership. So, you know, books and things like that. Um, and even, you know, podcasts, newsletters, those type of things. And then how do I essentially create an expansive digital infrastructure ecosystem? I like to call it a digital college campus uh, that helps, you know, make wellness education more attainable for individuals and just to have fun. Like there's there's such a lack of joy in the space mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I, I want to help resolve that, too. There's a lack of joy in the space. Yeah, what do you mean by that? The shit's miserable. Like you, it's miserable. Like you log on the internet and what, right? And mm. it's, you know, it's different for certain people, but what? You're hit with e either images of somebody that is, say, ripped or, an, or a woman that's skinny or so something that probably triggers some sort of body dysmorphia in you, regardless mm. of what you are. And then from there, you're told that you're missing this nutrient or you need to get this, you need to get that, or that you're on your phone too much, you need to be more productive, or you probably should just be meditating, or you need this healthy food. Mm. What the, what is this, right? So my thing is like, can we just bring uh, the joy back? One of my favorite podcasts, I don't listen to many podcasts, honestly. Uh, I'm trying to change that just because, you know, one thing that I do believe is that you can learn a lot from people you don't like. And at the same time, it's, it also f forces me to focus on one thing. I just think podcasts are a little bit too long. But that's a story for a different day. But one of my favorite podcasts is Philosophy Today or F Philosophy Now, maybe. And um, he was talking about, I think it was one of my friends sent it to me, it was Susan uh, Sontag. Shout out, you know, Chickie's Vintage. Kathleen sent this to me. And uh, in it, they had talked, to, he said a quote about how if you essentially, when you constantly analyze things, you possibly alienate yourself from them all the time. And if we're constantly analyzing our health through this, through, through both a psychoanalytic and perhaps too heavily data-driven perspective, and I've talked about this before with wearables and the like, are you alienating yourself from said existence, right? Rather than us being here and the ability to use our ingenuity to improve our health so we can perhaps just enjoy being here. Mm. And, you know, I want to bring that back through, you know, the concept of sport of life, being an athlete of life. And I just want people to have fun again. Like if things are just, people are too blessed to be this miserable. And I, I just don't think health should be that way. I'm not saying all health is, you know, sometimes, you know, you see, I've seen the work that I do hopefully reinvigorate people, but I think there's a greater mass of individuals we could be reaching. And yeah, I, you know, I, I really do look at it as a, like a philosophical and social movement. And, you know, I'm just trying to lead my flock or the people that believe in me to help. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, I like how you like started it off when you said this shit isn't fun anymore. And <laughs> it's, um, it's interesting. I remember like a few days ago, I watched this interview between Jon Stewart and Bob Iger, uh, Bob Iger, CEO of Disney. And they're talking about media, like the state of media and the news media. And one of the things um, Bob Iger is talking about is like incentives. Like if you think about the incentives for the media when they're reporting news, it's not purely accuracy. It's not purely it's the accuracy and the, the truth. It's entertainment, but even more than that, it's, um, they make money through reactions. So if, you, if, if, if I report a story and you just have a neutral reaction, you shrug your shoulders, that's a loss because like, you can't monetize that. You monetize it when people have extreme reactions. And when you were talking about health and fitness and even in the, the social media space, 
everything that we see online, everything that we see on our feed, everything that's performing well, it's all to get us to make, have a reaction, right? Like, oh, I should be meditating. I should be losing weight. It's like you're trying to... Yeah, but you're sugarcoating it. It's not, that's not, that's not, uh, yes, you want to have a reaction, but that's, that's weaponizing human emotion mm. for either commerce or to have such an extreme reaction that you now, as we see within news, you often uh, have, have uh, cr then create bad judgments and create polarization. Mm. So the scary part is that news becomes entertainment. Entertainment mm. kind of becomes news. You don't really know what to trust. People don't really read anything anymore. Lack of critical thinking. And that creates a whole cascade of issues. And this is why, you know, understanding why you think the way that you think is, is important. But it just seems that we are... I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where it goes, but you know, I think I'm at the point where I kind of remove myself from mass media consumption and just focus on my work. I'm a very big believer of Seth Godin and his thought process. He's a, you know, he's a marketing guy, huge guy and his thought process of enough instead of more. I think a lot of us chase the more, how big can our audience get? How can we do this? How can we do that? And I'm like, hold up, let me just help the people that can help. And then diffuse through larger existing ecosystems that could possibly reach more people. That's how I approach my work. Mm. I, there's a difference between consumer and consumption. At the end of the day, I don't care anymore. I'm not trying to chase a mass amalgamation of individuals. If you believe in what I'm doing, let me set up the structures that are there so you could get to where you need to be. Now, if it grows larger than that, totally fine. But I just need to reach the right people so that I can diffuse through greater ecosystems. Whether that's I've worked with Nike, I've worked with Dyson, I've worked with Smartwater. I have some other, th I've worked with Hyper Ice, I've worked with Whoop, I've worked with whatever, a bunch of brands and, uh, you know, hopefully more on the pipeline. But think about if I provide a service and I could reach different crowds through those, m some of them multinational billion dollar plus corporations. Mm. So I think of health and wellness as a service because that's kind of, kind of what it is. But a lot of it has been through weaponization because we've created these small tribal states where the only way for that leader to survive is for for you to fully believe in them and what they are saying so that then they could make money off of your attention. I've been very lucky where I have not had to make money off of attention. I've made money off of now I've been, I'm able to capture attention, but I've been made money off providing a service. And since health and wellness is rel is, uh, is, is in the zeitgeist now, I've been able to make money through scaling that through existing partnerships. So my work is a little bit different and I've been, and you know, I've been lucky and utilize my skill set a bunch of different ways. I've been lucky for that. But now, you know, it's about consolidating the IP and, and you know, fully distilling things down and, and, and you know, putting a, putting a foot in the ground. But yeah, the emotion and, and weaponization of things is, 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 a, is a dangerous precedent, um, especially within the health and wellness space, especially as it pertains to men in, and especially uh, health and wellness on the men's side is getting a lot more conservative, uh, which you know, it sometimes can't be worrisome. There's nothing wrong with being, you know, conservative, but when it becomes a little bit right wing tropes, it's very bizarre to me. But yeah, that's a that's a different discussion. <laughs> mm. Mm. I can tell you do a lot of um, thinking. Read, yeah, I, I'm a Pisces. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. yeah, I think about it a lot because it's theory. It's political theory. Health and wellness is not just eat this, do this, do that. Da, 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 da. It's all connected to to essentially political theory and, 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 and current culture and justice, right? Should we, why do we have to worry so much about our food? Mm. Why do we have to worry about the way that we work out? Why do we have to worry about the way that we are setting up our bedrooms? Why do we have to think about the supplements we have to take? This is not, it's not a normal part of existence. Now, it's not all bad, but you know, if we are existing within structures that should be doing things to take care of us, but don't, then we have to take more agency upon ourselves. And I think there's liberation through that, but it's not just simply this thought process of, oh, people just aren't taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. When of course, as a piece of it, there's more to that, you know? Right now the FDA is trying to, de to, to define what healthy is. I think all of us here could, would agree that Lucky Charms and Fruit Loops aren't healthy, mm -hmm. right? right? But a lot of people don't have health literacy. So if I go in the store, and I see that is on the shelf and it's labeled as healthy, I might believe it, whether it, I'm incredulous about that or not, it doesn't matter. And now you have, you know, General Mills trying to spend millions of dollars so that the FDA does not limit what they could put on their box so they can still say that it's healthy. 
Mm. What kind of shit is that? Right. Like, why do I have to work against that? Mm. That's crazy. You know what I mean? And then people like, oh, the government doesn't care. It's like you got to realize is that, you know, you also people want to say small want to have, you know, small government until it's time until it's time for them to actually make decisions. And then private entities want to come in and say, no, that's not how it works to the government. When you're supposed to, when, when, when they, whatever, lobby for, for things that don't make sense in my opinion. But it's all to say, like, look about the greater cultural Milo. And I know we often want to go the other way and the things that are big now, or, you know, I can't listen to a health and wellness podcast without a product being, you know, plugged every, every five minutes. But my thing is, I just want to stick to the, the foundational basics. Simple isn't always easy, but I just want to be, I just want to help onboard people into the basic basic behaviors that you could do every day so you don't have to do the super intricate stuff when you're sick right mm. what are the basic things i want to i look at it like this my at least in this point until you know a continuous development i like to say my point is to inspire the individuals the in younger generation and of course older but younger too where we have a base level of health i want you to not lose it don't i'm i'm my expertise right now I can, if you come to me and you're sick with something super distinct or whatever, that's not what I'm here for. Mm. The modern medical system is great for that. Go figure out distinctly what is wrong with you and work with a doc, a medical team for you to get out of that hole. Once you're out of that hole, come see me. But my point and my purpose is for to help people not get in that hole mm. and you create the infrastructure so they could have autonomy. It is not to say that the, the the contemporary medical system does not work, that they do all this wrong. Of course, there's certain things they do wrong. But it's, it's a, it is amazing, a miraculous ecosystem when, uh, when you could take a pill and it could help you solve something immediately. Mm. Now, my issue is there's no preventative healthcare ecosystem. So it's my desire to help build that. And I think it could be part of the standard healthcare ecosystem. But my job is not to bash and do all these things. My job is to help you think about things differently and to help you stay well before you need what I honestly do believe is, and it has its pitfalls, but it's a pretty wonderful and miraculous medical system that we have. Mm. Now, the issues of privatization, lack of health care, and all that stuff for sure. But yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. It's like, how do, you, how do I help people stay well and, you know, before they have to use the crutch of the, of the health care system? Yeah. You know, when I was listening um, even to in other interviews you've done or like reading um, or even like watching some of your videos and even what you just said now, you spoke about like a base level. I'm curious, for someone that is as deep into this field as you are, what does a base level even mean? People, this is what throws me off, right? Because I, I'll go and I'll see people, or I'll see my friends and be like, oh, I bet you ran 10 miles this morning type of thing. Mm. And I'm like, no, I don't. This is my thing. Every, this throws everybody off. But one, I'm lazy and I don't even like working out all the time. Laziness, I call it strategic laziness, creates ingenuity. Mm. And it helps you say, I don't want to have my back, back against the wall. I had dinner with my brother yesterday and, you know, we check in with each other because we're all going through some things. And he said, the one thing that I recommend for you is that you just handle the issues when they raise up. Handle the issues when you raise up. You, and that works in every field of life, whether that's relationships, whether that's money, or that's your health. So yeah. when we're talking about the base, right? The base level for me is doing the things that don't have your back against the wall. So it's simple shit. And that's why I think exercise snacks works very well. It throws people off that half of the time, this is all that I do, is that you could wake up in the morning and you could do 10 minutes of calisthenics and you could do 10 minutes of meditation. Mm. Or you could do just do 20 minutes of calisthenics. Or you could do five minutes of calisthenics, 15 minutes of meditation, right? Get your mind and body right and do that consistently. That's just base. That's nothing crazy. I'm not telling you to go in a cryo chamber. I'm not telling you to take a cold shower. I'm not telling you to go outside and run, you know, 10 miles or, you know, just, you know, stay tough or anything like that. I'm saying, hold up. You woke up, you were just asleep for eight hours. My philosophy is, how do you use small chunks of time that will then uh, improve the next big chunk, right? So that 20 mm. minutes in the morning can make the next six to seven hours of your day better. Mm. And then if you have a 20 minute bedtime routine and that improves your sleep for the next eight hours, you just use 40 minutes to improve 12 plus hours. Mm. You cannot tell me that you don't have time for that. Mm. You do. No, the, the thing is, the paradigm that's been placed about how, about how you get your base level 
has been has been pushed to be so hard, right? So base level really for 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 me is you look at it like this. There's three key things. There's or maybe four. Right? There's your mind. Mm. There's taking care of your body, of course, physical activity. There's what you put in it, right? So the chemical foundational components. And then there's rest and sleep, which are a little bit different, but there's rest and sleep. So if you have those big four, how do you keep those in check? And that's all you have to think about. And then you have to think about what are the ones that I have to spend a little bit more time on that I know that are good for me? And what are the ones that I have a minimum effective dosage? Mm. But the issue is, is that people don't start to care until their back is against the wall. So then they have to work so hard to get out of the base, right? So the, mm. they have to work so hard to get out of the hole back to base. So what they actually have to do is work harder than me mm. to get into a place that's worse than me. Because you're getting out of the hole. <laughs> yeah. So they're confused that I constantly have to do less just because, of course, due to certain things, thankful to my upbringing, all that type of thing, that I have to constantly do less than them to still be a little bit more. But of course, there's other things that I have to deal with in terms of, you know, my 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 personal health. But I want people to realize is like, just nip it in the bud. Never let yourself get too deep in a hole. And I call that, it's called the four point play. It's a philosophy from football. I played college football at Penn. Mm -hmm. And there's a thought process called a four point play. And, not, and a lot of people don't think about, right? So if, for those who don't know American football, right? You have offense and defense. Yeah. For, to keep it simple, American football, not, you know, Londoners, Developed. soccer, football, whatever. Let's not get into that. Yeah, let's not debate. <laughs> you have an offense and a defense, right? Everybody thinks about offense. Mm. I got to score. I got to score. I got to score. The offense, when it's humming, it's humming, right? You're going to put those points up, right? Yeah. But the issue, what happens when the offense isn't humming, right? And you got to play defense. So if the, let's look at it like this. On so the days where you wake up and don't want to do shit, mm. what's happening there? Your offense isn't humming. You're tired, you're probably not going to put points up. This is when you play defense, right? So think of the adverse uh, adversary, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that's trying to push you back is trying to score on you, Yeah. right? A touchdown is worth, let's say, seven points. That's where you get it in the end zone. But a field goal is worth three. Mm. So on those days where I don't feel like doing shit, can I play just enough defense to only give up three points? Mm. I now have a four-point play. Or instead of giving up seven, I've only given up three, mm. right? And maybe that's two days in a row where I give up three points. So that's a total of six mm. instead of 14, right? Mm. That hole's not too deep. I just needed two days. You know, I like to say some days I try my best. Other days I need a little rest. I need to say two days of just rest. Mm. Gave up a couple field goals, but I'm doing all right. You know, maybe I missed the workout. It only got 10 minutes in, but I made sure to say to focus on my sleep. So that's, that's what hedged. So that's why I only gave up four or three points instead of seven. Now I'm feeling good. I get the ball back. Mm. I put up three touchdowns. I'm up 21-6. Mm. Instead of I wasted two days and I gave, say I gave up two or three touchdowns, so 14 or 21 points, mm. right? And so even when I got the ball back, if I put up three touchdowns, it's tied. It's 0-0. Zero, mm. zero. I didn't so I did, I gave up too many points. Mm. So that's my key. And what I've realized now in life is uh, the days where it's, I'm just hurting. Mm. Where I'm either I'm, I'm overworked or I've been traveling or I've been eating a little shitty, whatever. I'm like, all right, Joe, four point play, four point play. What if just nail, let's put in a defensive game plan today that I know either it'll be a wash or I'll only give up three, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe I'll get a lucky break, you know, the offense will fumble the ball or I'll catch a little energy in the day mm -hmm. and maybe I'll score three or seven. But whatever you do, do not give up. Don't give up too many points. And that's kind of how I approach my health. Mm. no that's cool that's interesting um it's funny as well because i've gotten into i've been watching a lot of american football in the last 18 months and even when you listen to the commentary they'll talk about that you know when like the offense is just they're having like three and outs three and outs yeah. three and outs <clears throat> and then uh especially if the defense is playing against the highly powered offense on the other side if they only concede three, they're like, okay, the defense kind of bailed them out. Yeah. Give them another shot. Give them another Offense shot. Offense wins games, defense wins championships. Yeah. That's how it goes. And yeah. that's in life too, right? Because defense has is it, defense is essentially the consistent efforts. Yeah. Offense are those big catalysts, right? So your defense are those base things that you put in. And then the offense is when, you know, you can become the greatest show on turf, right? Yeah. You know, shout out to the old Rams. Is that then, all right, I found this small new thing that 
that, you know, in my blood test that people are overlooking, I put this in, Ooh, I got a burst of energy. Now I'm feeling good. Right. Mm. But you know, I, yeah, I just think that that's the key. So the thing is, is keep that baseline. And then if you want to upskill, if you're really into this shit, if you, you know, if you love the, 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 the biohacking, you love the quantified self, or you love the trackers, you love that type of thing. Cool. That's, you know, that's a little flavor and pizzazz in your offense, but it doesn't work unless you do the basics. And I think people just for whatever reason, think the the basics don't work or you just have to look yourself in the mirror and admit you're not doing them, mm. you know? And that's where you kind of get thrown off. And for me, that's sleep. Like I struggle with sleep just because sometimes I'll be, be out a little bit too late or I'll just catch ideas at night or that type of thing. But, you know, even among all my supplement regimens and all these other things, all of that is a wash unless I, unless I get sleep. Right. Mm. So this past weekend I was, I'm fucking tired. Mm. Call my, and I know when I'm tired because I have this thing, I've been a little bit in a, you know, traditional Chinese medicine a little bit. And I have a very, very base novice understanding, but it was just a situation where I could feel the da- dampness in my body, essentially. Like I'm somebody that runs hot of like a very good, whatever fire energy. Mm. Right. And when I'm not, and when I'm when either not running hot or I could feel a dampness in, in me, which basically means that there's essentially an energy that runs. You, they, they call it uh, chi or whatever. Like there's just energy runs to your body. Sometimes some things are a little running too over. Some things are a little under. I felt a little under, mm. right? And, and I could feel it when I fe- essentially feels like I have something in my throat, mm. but there's nothing in my throat. Yeah. It's like a, a whatever, a throat dampness. So then from there, you know, I was just trying to figure out all this stuff. I'm like, all right, I got to get acupuncture. You know, I got to go in a float, float tank. I got to do this and do that. And I went and got some Chinese herbs and things. But then when it came down to it, you know, even in all the literature and what I knew in my heart of hearts, and I sat back and I thought about it, I was like, yo, you just got to sleep. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm like, that's the foundation of it all. And that's, you know, it's just, and I think about it and I went through my week and my days and the month and I was like, yo, you, you honestly g- gave up about eight hours of sleep this week mm. just because of dumb shit that I shouldn't have been doing. And, you know, I think you perform those audits and get back to the basics. And I don't know. I'll let you ask more questions. But I just guess that, you know, sometimes that stuff isn't sexy. Mm. You know what? I think um, one thing I've always found interesting, even in my own journey, because I think it was one of the reasons, like, I love speaking to people that have, like, a sports background. Yeah. Because obviously I'm going down the podcast route and I want to build, like, a, like, I want to build, like, a massive media company. Like, that's my ambition now. But if you asked, like, the kid version of Callum, like, what he wanted to be, like, an athlete every day. Like, I, I love the, the, like, competition. And I think even more, I love the improvement that comes with sports. Yeah. And what I mean is, like, um, sports is all about, it's all about, like, minuscule micro improvements every day through just showing up. Mm-hmm. It's about persistence. And I think the most beautiful thing about sports is there's so many life lessons in sports and having a great life, having a a successful life. One of the things I realized is it's actually quite simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big difference. Yeah. There's certain, well, you realize there's certain principles. There's certain things that are actually true in uh, most arenas of life. And one of the things that my, my daddy always used to drill to me was like, focus on the foundation. Yeah. So in any endeavor in life, there's the foundation, there's the simple things, which typically tend to be like boring, to be honest. And that's what makes it difficult. And that's why um, we pursue the more like elaborate, the more exciting things. A lot of the times that's a distraction from the foundation. and. I think one of the things um, one of the things that I'm interested in is like when you talk about not ending up in a hole, yep, I think, and even when you talk about um being tired and realizing that you're tired, mm-hmm. it's like let's take that down to the foundation to be able to have that thought requires a lot of self awareness of analyzing your own behaviors over and over again, because the mind can be deceiving. Yeah, and sometimes but, the, the mind can, and, and let me tell you what I mean by that. 
sometimes you can think that you feel a certain way for a certain reason, but it's actually something completely different. So even with yourself, sometimes it's difficult to know what is true and what is fake. There's a lot of self-awareness that it takes to know, like, I'm just bullshitting myself right now. Well, it's different between, what you're talking about is the difference between real and valid, which are two different things. So there's a few Ex- things that you talk about. Explain that. What does that mean? I'll, I'll talk, uh, b- before I get to that, let me just say what you're talking about with sport or whatever is that there's a certain piousness uh, that's uh, in discipline that's associated with any sort of attainment, right? For better, for worse. Mm. And people need to learn how to be religious without religion. And that's one of the issues that we have right now is that the increased secularism in society is removing work ethic. And for whether that's Puritan or otherwise, was this thought process of religion was, it was able to give guardrails that as bad as religion is, and a lot of them, there's just the same base values that if you do them, you will have success. Mm-hmm. Now the question becomes, and this is why, you know, sport of life and design yourself type of energy is, can you create your own art philosophy that is essentially your religion without being religious, without mm-hmm. being caught up in the doctrine and the dogma that make a lot of these religions problematic? There are just, what is your value system? Like if you go into a company, they give you a handbook, this is, how, this is what we run by. Mm. What's your individual one? And that's what it comes down to those minuscule improvements type of thing. If I have a code of ethics that I know that I live by, mm. I, it, makes that, it makes it that much easier to live life. So, you know, in Rick Rubin's new book, he talks about this a lot. Discipline actually creates freedom. Then the thought that you're talking about is, and you know, this is where the, it, one of the issues that I have, I guess, with whatever Western philosophy, the thought process that the body always has to be punished, that the body doesn't know, right? That the mind and rational mind is always better than the body. Mm. It's very, you know, Cartesian dualism is, you know, what this started from. And, that, and that's not the case. The body has this knowledge where you were able to get, you know, some call it intuition. Really what it is is interoception, which is another sense in the body. Sometimes you walk in a room and you're hit with a feeling, oh, something's not right in here. I shouldn't be in here. Mm. Think about how majestic that is, that your body's able to pick something up very quickly, you distill it into a feeling that then you can act on. Now, a lot of us either- uh, That's instinct. Yeah, yeah, but that but people take it for granted. It's, mm. It could be instinct, it could be intuition, it could be interoception, but you train those things. And fitness is one of the ways you can train it. And this is why I suggest people don't always listen to music when they work out. So you could hear and feel the feedback, especially during marathon training, that your body is giving you. And then you decide- and this What is, does that mean? Just listen, just, just, just bear with me one second. And then you, you get to the point of real versus valid. Mm which is the thought process of, and this is why it's just quick analyzation, right? Mm. When you get hit with a feeling, right? And it feels very real because it is. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean it's correct or valid. So that if you're hit with something, right? Mm. And you know this is kind of like a little bit of exposure therapy, I guess. You're then hit with something, and then what you feel, does that outcome actually happen? If mm. it does, then what you were feeling was valid. Mm. Stick with that. Trust that. If it doesn't, then what you felt was real, but it was not correct. So where is that? Can you learn from that disconnect and improve? In the same way, you shoot a ball. Oh, that felt good, but it was off. What's that small little tweak that then can make that connection better so that you understand if it actually feels good, it is a good shot. Mm. So the key is, it's to not overanalyze, but you're con- if, once I get that feedback in real time in this experiment of life, Mm. then I have the better ability to be able to act on those things. So you cannot, just because you have an emotion does not mean it is valid or correct. It just Mm. means it is real. But you cannot judge things just simply, and this is why words matter, definitions matter, whatever, results matter. Just because you feel something does not mean it's correct. And the sooner you realize that, the easier life becomes. Now to your other point uh, that you're asking about, um, like, I guess, what does that mean or how do you hone that? Essentially, there's a sense in the body called interoception, which is basically how do I, how do I kind of, yeah, validate what my body is kind of telling me in the moment? So mm-hmm. these feelings of, say, hu- qualitative hunger, thirst, anxiety, that type of thing. So my body's giving me some type of feedback due to something. Why is that, right? Oftentimes, people get jitters because they'll intake some sort of caffeine or people get you know tired when they're eating a sort of food, that type of thing. A lot of that is just cultivating mindfulness. So you pay you you pay attention and don't numb those feelings, whether that's by food, whether that's by phone, whether by honestly some people that's sex, whether that's sleep, whether that's whatever. Don't run from these feelings that you have. Figure, and that's why 
you know, therapy kind of works mm -hmm. because it's through, a, you know, some argues through a technique called focusing where you're able just to better understand what your body is telling you, understand the difference between validity mm -hmm. and realness, and then continue to upgrade your operating system so you're out in the world now being able to better navigate it. Mm. And that, and that's the thing I think is is important for a lot of people. Then once you understand the relationship with yourself, then interpersonal relationships come into play and things of that nature. But it's all trainable. Everything is trainable. You are not fixed. And, and in the same way, you're not broken. So you can't be fixed. So you might as well take advantage of that. Mm. Okay. Now, the reason I... Um... I interrupt at certain points is because you say so many things <laughs> and there's like it's um it's the beginning of a thread like yeah, it's the yeah, it's yeah. the beginning of a thread and the thread what what you said there's a certain level of like um maybe this is an exaggeration there's a certain level of genius to it there's a certain level of insight to it and it needs to be expanded upon pull, it needs to be pull put the thread in i just had to finish the thought but um, pull, pull it pull the thread. yeah let's pull it let's pull it right now so one of the things i like that you said is like um because when i was listening to you it's like a lot of the times we're distracted so our body's giving a feeling but then it's like instantly grab my phone mm -hmm. instantly put on the tv yeah instantly um you said sex as well like there's so many different things that we do and urges um, it's crazy. Even sometimes I'm working and I'm doing a task that I don't really want to do. And all of a sudden it's like you get, the, you're suddenly hungry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You suddenly, I want to go out or like, um, you want to distract yourself. And I want to, I always, when I do these conversations, I always want it to be actionable. I always want it to feel real for the audience. So when you have that feeling and you're distracting yourself and you're like, I want to grab my phone. I want to do this other activity to distract. What should I be doing instead? How do I get more in tune with my body and what's happening in the moment? Talk to yourself. Like, because for instance, right? It, I know it sounds weird, but, you know, self-distancing is very powerful. And the way to do that is through third person. Mm. I have the, I've worked on that a lot so much that I now have the ability, I now have the internal dialogue that essentially self distances for me where something will tell me, Joe, what are you doing? And I'll be like, you know what, you're right. And mm. I'll be like, let me just see. And like, if I'm about to reach for my phone, it's like, Joe, do you really want to do that? And I'm like, no, what's the point, right? So, or you can just mm. put it away. I do have a clear lock box in my apartment where I just lock my phone away. When I catch myself doing something that I shouldn't, I kind of sit with it for a second. I'm like, okay, why did I want to do that? I think there's that, you know, they say there's that little blip, whatever, that synaptic space between uh, reaction and, the, and that first thought, right? And if you could sit, if you could sit with that, what happens to you versus the reaction, just for a second, then you can interrupt it, right? You can mm. cut off that fuse so that mm. I'm no longer doing this or I'm no longer doing that. You teach yourself to do that first by removing the negative thing. So, you know, there's a hierarchy of comp competence, right? One of the ways very easily is like a child, you remove it from yourself. If you know the phone's going to distract you, you remove it from you, right? Mm. And then you catch yourself trying to do something that you don't actually have access to. So you begin to question. I'm like, yo, why the fuck do I want to reach for my phone so much? There's nothing going on. Mm. So I haven't had my phone for about two hours. I go and check my phone. Maybe there's one or two messages, but nothing really going on. Maybe whatever, a couple, few emails. So I'm not Joe Biden. The world's not burning. Yeah. Right. So the way is to train yourself like anything else, right? And then from there, but then when you're in the game, you're in the heat of the moment, right? Mm. In the same way an athlete practices, then in a game, you can't set it up the best way you want, but you've worked enough to understand how things feel. So then when I'm in the heat of the moment, whether, you know, I'm on stage giving a talk or, you know, I'm doing a work and a deadline's there and I want to reach for my phone, you're able to self-center and check yourself like, hold up. We've been here before, what it is that we're doing, what it is that we need to accomplish. So mm. it truly is train yourself, right? It's like, you know, you spend mo most of your time alone. It's okay to do the weird stuff. And again, I'm telling you self-distance, which is basically treat yourself like a stranger for a second, but a stranger you know and fucking love, right? So you got, mm. you know, those little tricks that make you tick. So if I was to ask you that same question, you come to, you be very simply be like, yo, Joe, why are you checking your phone? Just put it over there or just hold up. You'll be able to get this work done. Mm. So you, you, you often give better advice to strangers than yourself, even though Facts. you more yeah. know more about yourself than you know more about strangers. Mm. 
So that's the thing. It's like, can I internally, can I create self-distancing through third person talk that then will lead to an internal dialogue that will check me from doing these things before I do them? There's a lot of research on self-distancing and self-distancing talk. It's one of the greatest tools you can use. And I know, it, you know, people are like, what, why this sounds crazy. But if you talk to yourself in a third person, and this is why a lot of people who are successful do that, you know, besides the very egocentric ones. And, you know, you have a lot of internal dialogue. It'll help you a lot. So, again, I think everything can be trained. So just take a step back, relax, create your game plan. Discipline makes freedom. I'm telling you, map out, map out your days and know your pain points, man. And that's how everything, everything becomes easier. Mm. You know, um, that's interesting. I like the discipline creates freedom. It's like the mm. contrast I find interesting. Because if you just thought of the words, right, you would think that discipline and freedom, they'd almost be on like opposite spectrums. But I think, I think opposites sometimes like they work, like the contrast makes things work. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's very Taoist, I suppose, but you know, every, everything's contained within everything else. So you, you know, everything has a door to something else. And there, the, you know, there's a, the door within, if you want to open the door to freedom, you got to be disciplined. Right. Cause how do you get, honestly, how do you get freedom now? It's through some either, unless you were born into it, it's either through some, it's either through some chain of strategic action that you were very focused on that you arrive on the other side mm. right but you had to often do that through discipline and then often through discipline through parameters that you can create yourself because you know that it works there's a difference because if you're you have to essentially create models that work for you mm. just because something is a model doesn't mean it actually works but then once you create those frameworks that work for you and you're disciplined through that on the other side of that is freedom so yeah, it does seem counterintuitive, but also at the same time, how does anything get done? How does this podcast get done? Hmm. There's a certain, you have an a order of operations that you have to be relatively disciplined a, a, about that give hmm. a framework that leads to a, lead to a final product. Hmm. And I know life is a little bit more qualitative than that, but if you, know, if you have your, your, your regimen that has those foundational values and you're disciplined about it, and you make the determination after you try things to keep the things that work, update or discard the things that don't, how do you not end up better? Hmm. You know what it is as well, actually? And it's interesting when you say the thing, it's something that I've noticed as well, is um, you'll speak to someone and they'll give you advice and they can listen to your problems and give you the best fucking advice you've ever heard in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And then, especially if you know the person, You'll look at their life and you'll be like, wait, how can you diagnose my problem, give an exact solution in specificity, but in your own life, there's like, there's just these like alarming blind spots, <laughs> like alarming. And I think it's so true is um, we're able to give better advice to other people. And then the question is, well, why is that the case? And I guess my thinking is, is because you can be more objective. The thing that's stopping you from applying that great advice in your own life is that you're emotionally involved. You're, yeah, yeah. you're directly involved. So it's harder to see things for what they truly are. Yeah. I mean, there's a the famous saying, right? It's like you judge people based upon you judge people based upon their actions, not how they felt or meant. And you judge yourself based upon what, you know, your emotions and how how you felt about the situation instead of what you did, right? So a lot of it's not, you know, you should judge yourself outcome based, right? And it's and it's very easy to give advice to a stranger or whatever because you're just judging the outcome, not knowing their emotions. So it's not to be completely rational and cold hearted, but you have to judge yourself based upon what are and this is why it's about strategy. It's did what I do work. Yes or no. I don't want to hear anything else about it. And it's how I approach myself. Did it work? Mm. Yes or no. And that's that's all. If it did, if it worked, right? Good. But if it was still a bad strategy, update it. Update mm. it, right? And then it, but it's just doing that. It's being rel it's just being relatively honest. It's like you have to look at your and this is the difficulty sometimes with health is that sometimes I have to look myself in the mirror and say, "Oh, that's my it was my fault." It was my fault. I take full responsibility. I will figure this out moving forward. 
a lot of people don't want to do that with the way they either frame it or the, the questions that they have or whatever. And I'm, and then you have to, at, for anything, again, just ask yourself, did I do it or did I not? And did it work or did it not? Mm. And then update your plan accordingly. And that's why all this shit works with, with psychedelics, with MDMA, with LSD. What, what does it do? It dissolves the ego and self distances. That's all that the research shows. A lot of it, not all, but a lot of it shows. And mushrooms is a self distancing effect. You could, you could arguably call it a dissolving of the ego, but you could train yourself to do that through self talk and, of course, through a little bit of breathing practices to calm you down. But that's really all you have to do. It's that at the end of the day, if a CEO shows up for his earnings call, He's not going to have a sob story. What do the shareholders want to know? Mm. Did it work or did it not? Did you make money? Did you lose money? What were the results? And if you could have more of a humanizing, but more of a humanizing uh, approach to that, it's okay, did it work? Let me understand why and approach myself through that. And that's why I think audits and these things are successful. But, you know, that's how I'm just approaching my life is either it worked or it didn't. And what were the long term objectives that I wanted? And I want more emotional stability. And I want more improvement in my physical health. Do I want an improvement in my blood test? Did I want to make more money? Did I want to do I want to find a girlfriend or a significant other? Is what I'm doing worked or didn't? Mm. And that's it. Just call it a spade a spade. No more stories. Everybody has a fucking story. Excuse mm. my language. You see this within sport in a in a amateur athlete world. I'm I'm not saying I'm the shit. I did not make it to the pros. Did I want to perhaps play pro? Yeah. Did I want to fully do certain things that it took to get there? Probably not. I didn't want to play special teams. I didn't play special in football. I never played special teams, mm. right? And if you want to make it to the pros from a small school, that's typically what you got to do. I dealt with injuries, a bunch of other things. I didn't want to deal with that. But, you know, sh shout out all the people that I played with at Penn that did, and now are in the league and successful. Then the quite then, but then from there, it uh it just really becomes that thought process of, you know, can for the rest of my life, just be honest. I did. I was I honest about putting in the work, and did I get the results that I wanted? And when you're out here, you know, doing the things like us, where at the end of the day, you got to create an economy. Now, we we of course we're still connected to it, but mm. you got to create a fucking economy for yourself, bro. Like you left your job, mm. you said I'm gonna go in on this full time. You, you said I'm gonna bet on myself. Mm. Now who the fuck cares about how you feel? Mm. Now you got to eat. Mm. It's a results driven life. Mm. And too many people hide from that. And you get high from that if you want to stay safe, which is fine. You can still make a lot of money and things in that world. You got this cozy nine to five. You're doing your thing. You got the cushion. Mm. But there's a certain level, especially as I think as it pertains to your health, it's either I did or I didn't. And how am I going to fix it? And, mm. you know, that's what I just think it's about. Maybe it's a little bit, you know, traditional. So some people say I have a little bit of a very kind of old school not necessarily old school, but just like a very guttural kind of like. There's a harshness to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a harshness out of love. Like love is hard, dog. Yeah. If you love yourself, you got to be honest with yourself. Otherwise, you're going to be telling yourself a story your whole life. And I've struggled because I've told myself too many stories, whether that was some things in sports, whether it was other things in college, whether it's other things with work, whether it's doing this or not. And, you know. This is a little bit of an aside, and you know, I'll pass the mic back to you after this. But I remember, you know, I worked with Virgil on a lot of his projects in in Nike. Or if he he created a think tank in Nike called Architecture. He brought me onto it, and one of the things that he told me he was like, "I really wanted this to work for you," type of thing. Um, and but you know, there's two other people that are part of it. Uh, you know, they're called Clocks, but it was Mafuz and Chloe, and we had a meeting at you know at at, at Nike. And we were sitting in a meeting one day and, and you know, Mafu's kind of challenged me, which I respect him for, because I, you know, the way that I work is a little bit different. I was trying to get certain things off the ground. And, you know, what I've learned now is how I work is I have the idea. I build out mercenary teams and they help me get it done. I won't bring ideas across the finish line by myself. I'm an idea guy. I'm not going to say I'm the small, super minuscule kind of guy. And, he, and then he just looked at me and he goes, well, if you want to do something, just do it. Mm. How do you respond to that? Like, what's the excuse, right? Because if, if you didn't get something done, you're like, well, I have this idea. It's like, well, we'll support you. If you want to do it, just do it. Mm. So in my first job, what I learned through that was FIL, figure it out. And that's how you got to approach your life. It's like, let me figure out what I'm good at. Let me figure out what I'm not good at. And let me develop, 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 iterate, 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 iterate. And that's why health is design practice. 
Hmm. If there's a workout that I do, if I want to improve my physical health, but there's a workout that I do not like to do and I continue to do that workout and then I say working out is stupid, who is the foolish one? It's not the workout. It's you. Hmm. And call a spade a spade. People don't want to hear that. Oh, working out's not for me. No, you just tried a framework and applied it and it was the wrong framework, but you just kept doing it. So that's hmm. the difference between plan and strategy. If I have a plan, but I implement it through these processes, my strategy, hmm. and it does not work well, I need to change my plan. Perhaps not the strategy, but the plan. Hmm. So that's all that I'm saying. It's just like, be very aware of, of these things. And then it just becomes very natural. And then I know it works. I can implement it into my life and I can continuously upskill. It's like going from arithmetic to calculus. You can't just hop into calculus. Hmm. So that's, you know, that's how I look at it. Yeah. You know what? Um, this is going to seem like a weird digression, but I'm going to bring it back. Um, I remember Tom Brady has this, like, I guess like a docu-series, The Man in the Arena. Yeah. And I think about that, the man in the arena. And the, the idea, I guess, is like, um, if you're an athlete, especially if you're Brady, like you're like the GOAT quarterback, is you're in this arena, there's thousands of fans, there's millions of people watching at home, but you're the person in the arena. The fans are, I don't know, they're heckling you, they might be throwing stuff onto the field, but you're in the arena. And there's something... When I listen to you speak, and even when I think about like what you're talking about, the self-distancing, yeah, being able to distance, it's about being objective. It's about um, seeing the truth and like what really matters. And I'm going to bring a few different threads together here, right? So I love to watch like the, the sports debate shows. Yeah, yeah. Um, I PTI. love watching. I love yeah. PTI. I love watching like Skip and Shannon. I love watching First Take. And they have a lot of the same debates, right? Like if you, if you look at, um, if the Lakers are playing and LeBron's on the court and it doesn't matter what happened in that game, usually the narrative, the, the person who's responsible, it all comes down to the same thing. It's all, if the Lakers won, it's because LeBron did this. If the Lakers lost, it's because LeBron did this. If, um, if the Patriots are in the Super Bowl and Brady's playing quarterback, if the Patriots lost, it's because Brady didn't do something. If the Patriots won, it's because Brady did an amazing, like, last, uh, the last drive of the game. It was incredible, and it was Brady. It doesn't matter how he played for the other snaps. And it reminds me of what you're saying. And even, like, you, you made the point, um, like, even in my position, like, I need to create this economy, right? Yeah. There, there is, like, I feel... Since I've left my job, like I feel that it's um it's pressure, but it's opportunity. Um there's beauty in being the one that's accountable. There's beauty in being the one that has the most ownership. That person disproportionately loses the most, they disproportionately win the most. Yeah, it's high risk, high reward. And yeah, you know, that's why the American economy for better or for worse is set up set up to reward that if you do it right. But that's you know, of course there's some disproportionalities there, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, don't, to that point though, is also don't get, sometimes what those sports reporters get wrong is like, don't forget the invisible structures that are around you that will offer the support too, to help you, right? Whether mm -hmm. that's the, you know, whether that's your other teammates, whether that's the GMs, whether that's the fucking towel boy, all that. So I think a lot of people forget about, especially with health stuff, is like build your team, right? Mm -hmm. It's not me just figuring all this out. I'm lucky I could call my dad who's a doctor and I'd be like, yo, I just picked up some fucking he, she, woo from the from the Chinese herb shop. I just want to make sure I'm using this right. I could, you know, hit up my main general practitioner and be like, my creatine, my creatine levels are a little bit high. I want to figure out how to better support my kidneys and do further research with that, right? Mm -hmm. I could hit up my masseuse. And I'm like, all right, I need to come in for a massage because I know some things are off. I can hit up my friends if I need emotional support. I can hit up, you know, uh, people who help me with creative direction. And be like, yo, I, I want to figure this out. Let's cook, mm. right? So a lot of the times we often forget and how things are positioned within American, I think, uh, uh, American media is always kind of the, that goat status. It's always the guy. And yeah. yeah, there are certain people that are just better, but- the reason why all these things are even successful is because there's a whole, again, an ecosystem and a bureaucracy and a business built around those individuals. Mm. LeBron's not a billionaire on his own. Mm. He had to put trust in other, in other people, right? 
So that's the thing, too. I say this a lot. I talk about it in my master class is just build your team, mm. build them. Right. And at the end of the day, you know, that'll go a long way because you can't you also you can't take those steps forward by yourself. That's really that's what I think is important. Mm. But you have to take accountability for your part. Right. Like the quarterback can't throw the ball and catch it. Mm. Right. You're right. But then somebody also has to do the grunt work and block. Right. Maybe that's whatever the, the executive assistant, maybe that's whatever the fucking the fucking uh, the, the nurse practitioner that shows up to the crib and draws the blood or is doing that work. Right. So you're part of a greater whole. And I think that, you know, that's another discussion, but that's important to remember. Build your team. It mm. becomes so much easier. Who's helping you with your finances? Mm. Who's helping you with your mental, emotional health? And hey, whether that's a person or an app or whatever, a book, an author, someone you might not know who's helping you, you know, with your with your physical health, who's mm. helping you build the 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 social connections mm. well you know so that economy of self really is just a wellness design system right and that's what the ultra system is so physical health diet and diet and physical activity emotional health which is who's refilling your cup spiritual practices that type of thing and then you have your mental how are you getting more resilient and stronger your finances which a lot of people don't talk about money matters how you manage that who's teaching you about those things right you have the social you have the occupational you have the intellectual you have the environmental that's your economy of self. That's the economy of your health. Mm. But if you try to do, don't think you got to do it alone. But it all comes back to you, right? Because mm. if you don't pick up the phone and put out that call, if you don't hit up free agency and say you want to do this and that, how can anybody ever help you? Mm. So it's very old school. It's the old, you know, fucking God helps those who help themselves. It's the whole, you know, look within Greek mythology. All these lessons are present, right? You know, you look within Buddhism and the parables that are there. And, you know, when when you ask the guru, how do you attain enlightenment? He's like, as soon as you st- as soon as you as soon as you try, but also stop, mm. you know, and that's what I think people forget. It's like you, you can't think you're isolated because mm. if you're isolated, you lose. But there and I you wish I learned this a little bit earlier on. And there are people out there who want to help you. Like at the end of the day, Naomi Campbell saw something in me. You know, I work with Bella Hadid. She saw something in me, right? I look with Virgil Abloh. He saw something in me. Or Nike saw something in me. Dyson saw something in me. Sometimes it's just transactional, mm-hmm. right? I want to fulfill that outcome. But there was a person behind that business that said, hmm, I think Joe got it. Mm-hmm. And then you allow them to help you, right? But then mm-hmm. you also have to be, you know, I think vulnerable and open up and, and, and understand, you know, what you can provide, but also the help that you need. So that's my thing. Just never in this game, you can't get isolated, especially as black men, Mm -hmm. because as the further we go at the end of the day, the less of us uh, there are, but even taking race outside of it or that type of thing, the people that have the greatest success, right. Mm -hmm. Are those that have everything's relationships, everything's relationships. And that relationship starts with yourself, but dog call it obtuse goal attainment. And when it's weaponized, it might be called nepotism. But you can bypass a lot of behaviors off the strength of relationships. And that, but that's why you work hard on upskilling yourself. Because if once you once you ask for a favor based on a relationship, you have to have the background to be able to to validate it. Mm-hmm. And then that makes both of y'all look good. And you put in the work and are successful. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a way to get ahead both in health and in life. And yeah, it'll take you places. Mm. It's the follow through. You know, I think I, I have this thing where I think about everything in sports analogies. It's like, you know, when they're, they're passing the boss, they're passing the ball like around the three point line. Yeah. When LeBron swings it to, I don't know, Austin Reeves and it's the game's tying down and he needs to take the three. I need to believe that you're going to fucking. Yeah, AR-15. Like yeah. Steve Kerr hit those threes. That's why, I mean, Jordan carried, but Steve Kerr had to step up, hit those threes, right? Yeah. David Tyree had to catch that crazy pass from Eli Manning. Plaxico Burris had to catch that pass, mm. right? I mean, f- fucking Santonio Holmes, that crazy Ben Roethlisberger pass. I think it was against the Seahawks or whatever, right? Like it all comes down to, the, to, those, to the, a lot of those moments, right? So mm. somebody has to step up, but it's still those consistent act. The cra- again, it goes back to it. The crazy catches and plays don't matter if it's a blowout. So mm. you got to do those consistent activities to make you feel better. Oh, that's, good. that's the basic thing, man. Yeah. It's like, who gives a fuck about a magnesium supplement if, you just, if you're not sleeping? If, who, who cares about fucking NAD and anti-aging precursors, right? If you're, just, if you're not eating decently. Yeah. And, the, and that's, that's where you have to start. And we're at a stage and with our generation where I think it gets too overwhelming too fast. 
It's mm. just really like, come on, come on, do the basics, do the mm. basics before you think about the crazy catch. Don't ask me about the supplements I'm taking because you know because I've been fucking don't doing laps in the gym for years. What you need to be worried about is the the first off the basic things that you're doing before you get to that level. Yeah. So that's what I want people to realize, and there can be fun in the basics. Yeah. You know what? It's um I completely agree, and um. Yeah, you know, you know what's um, interesting. I think sometimes this is the way I say it to myself. Sometimes you just need to keep the game close. Facts. It's like um, some you'll see two teams going at it, and one team is clearly superior, but they cannot put the other team away. They can't put them away. And usually you see it with more like veteran squads, like just older teams. They'll just stick in there, stay in there. You see it in boxing all the time. Stay in there, stay in there, stay in there. Later rounds, fourth quarter. Stay in there. Let the experience play out. And then because they're close, now they can capitalize. It reminds me of what you were saying at the, at the beginning. Um, a lot of life is just not ending up in the hole. Yeah. It's just um, being at the base. Yeah. Be at the base. You know what? You, um, it's all relative. Because everybody else in the hole, you at the base, you, you on the mountaintop. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, in my, in my, how have I gotten to live in, right? To just... A lot of it is through basics, and of course, I do have a mastery of certain things. But you also just have to think of the relative, the the relativity of things. You know, by what what is it, twenty forty or so, one in two people are going to be obese, which is crazy. That's both through in, because of individual action, it's either twenty forty or twenty fifty. But it's all through in, individual action, and and of course, you know, the economic cultural system that we work in. But imagine you just fight against that for a second, right? And that you in de- and that you're in good shape. Right. Mm. And you're just in a shape that a human probably should be decent metabolic health, decent body composition. You're, you're at baseline, maybe on a small hill. But every now one in 50 plus percent of the population is obese. They're looking up to you like you a god. Mm. But everybody deserves, I think, that, you know, whatever, that relative mountaintop of health. So it's just like. Stop, you know, find the people that you can learn from even if you don't like them or agree with them is there something you can learn i mean there's there's so many people in the health and wellness space i'm just like you know they're, they're just so self-promotion or just putting out the wrong things most of the time but i'll listen to them i'll pick up some things pull that thread mm. and i'll up my game i'll up my skill i'll learn certain things but you know it's like how do we spread that on to other how do we spread that on to other people and it's certain things, right? Like everybody talks about legumes and how they have anti-nutrients, that type of thing. Mm. You dig in a little bit to it. There are certain components of beans that make it harder to process protein, right? But then to digest protein, but then you learn a little bit. Just because I learn from somebody I particularly don't agree with, said something that's correct and valid, then I learn how to still be able to assimilate, say, those, uh, those, those, those foods that might have those anti-nutrient components for best results type of thing. Mm. But, you know, it's just... Yeah, I won't ramble, but I just really just think those big four, man, just sleep, nutrition, rest, physical uh, physical activity, and, you know, how that connects to diet and, and mental health is huge. Yeah. You know, I want to take it further because that's, um, let's call that the base. Yeah. That's the base. That's you staying in the game. Yeah, yeah, facts. But then there's the moment, there's the moment when LeBron passes it to Austin Reeves. And when you were talking, you said... Um, Naomi Campbell gave you an opportunity. Yeah. Virgil Abloh gave you an opportunity. Bella Hadid gave you an opportunity. They passed you the ball. And then you talk about the follow through. So I, I, I want to talk about both moments. So what were you doing that they gave you the opportunity? What do you think they saw? And then what was the follow through? How did you make sure you delivered? Yeah, I mean, good question. I mean, I was fucking grinding, man. It's like people, like I first worked in food. I worked for this company called Healthware. It's a Chia Bar, a Chia C company that was acquired by PepsiCo. I was probably employee number five there. And I worked there out of school at Penn from about 2013 to 15, 16, uh, making $32,000 a year, maybe sleeping on my friend's couch, fucking going. But I would, you know, you would have to prove yourself in that game, right? So I would be standing in fucking Whole Foods and Battery Park City. My friends who work at Goldman are coming in. I'm fucking chopping up chia bars, handing them out to folks. Like, yo, what is Joe doing? Mm. Went to an Ivy League school. You got to swallow your pride. Mm. But that access that it got me to things and the stuff that I learned, right? So I was able to get, I made friends with people at Nike Run Clubs because this is before like whatever influencer strategy was a thing. I would show up to the run clubs. I would have some bars with me. 
be like, yo, have some of these. I go run with them, meet them, do that type of thing, infiltrate, always mm -hmm. show up, always show up. I do that with Nike. I did that with Lululemon. I did that with whatever, made relationships, right? Mm -hmm. From there, you know, I did that with, with uh, Lulu initially at a time. They then asked me to lead a couple of run clubs because I made a relationship there. I did. I showed up. Now I'm introducing people to my workout strategy, right? I'm hosting free workouts, not getting paid pop-ups on West Side Highway. Mm. Called them Ocho System Saturdays. Doing, doing it. Mm. Showing up. Mm. Clicking away. Clicking away. And then it builds on top of that. And then I started, you know, through a friend that I had met at Health Warrior, Hannah Bronfman. Met her at Health Warrior. Befriended her. And her now husband, Brendan Fallis, uh, then was able to start working at a gym at S10 uh, because they had introduced me. But, you know, I made sure all my stuff was clean. Did I have my certifications? Did I know what I was talking about, right? So I go in. Now I'm working at one of the preeminent private gyms in New York City, S10, while still working my full-time job at Health Warrior, right? Mm. Put in the work. Put in the work, right? Then... I got the Nike deal that I'm continuously upskilling. I get the Nike deal or Nike situation because Nike comes in and scouts a class. Hmm. It was called Run Strong. Uh, the woman who works for Peloton, Robin, used to teach it, right? Hmm. She hit me up the day before one of the classes. She said, I can't teach this class. I'm out of town. Can you cover it? Hmm. I had two choices there. It was an early class. Hmm. I did not want to cover it. <laughs> yeah. I did cover it. I may have been a little late, but whatever. I was there. 6.30, 7 a.m., show up. I'm like, whatever, let's do this. Got two choices. You know, you could be an asshole. It's early. You're annoyed. You're not going to give a good class. You'll just get through it. But I'm like, I'm here. I'm going to give a good experience. The people who were in that class that day happened to work for Nike. I had no idea they were there until they came up to me after the class. They said, Joe, we think you'd be a good fit for this. Do you want to uh, cut, we're doing, building out this program called 45 grand. We love you to be a part of it. I'm like, hell yeah, mm. sure. But guess what? I showed up, right? Mm. Then there's a whole other story about this, but essentially Nike didn't follow up with me until randomly one day. I get a call like three months later after this. They're like, Joe, we're, we're hosting audition, trainer auditions at the office. Can you come in? Mm. I had a choice. I had to catch a train in two hours to go to Boston. Mm. I had to give a talk and the lead with some workouts up there. I was like, I don't think I can make it. They were like, all right, you can do it when you come back. Get a call about 15 minutes later. They told me today's the only day you could do it. Mm. Are you going to come in or not? Mm. And I had to go in. I had no prep. No prep. Show up to the office. The mm. woman comes out, Aaron, God bless her soul. She said, Joe, I saw you. You weren't. And this is why people always got a voucher. She said, Joe, I saw you weren't on the list. I thought you'd be great for this. One, I wanted you here. I carved out a slot for you. I know you don't have much time. I'll give you 10 minutes to prep, and then you got to come in. You got to lead a workout for, for the people that are there. Have your music ready. Mm. Now I'm looking in this space, and there's, at the time, 2015, 16, this is all the who's who of the fitness space in New York City, mm. right? And I'm like, I love this shit. Mm. I'm like, you know, kill your idols type of thing. And, I, and she gave me 10 minutes of prep. I went in there, did well, and I eventually, you know, things cascaded, and I started to work for, work for Nike. And they brought, they brought me on. And then from there, you know, and this will eventually land how we, I got <laughs> to, to all the Naomi stuff. But it's a long, it's a through line of just constantly showing up that builds. And, you know, I started to train Virgil because of, I was just documenting my work on the internet. Just mm. documenting, documenting, putting it out, putting it out. You know, some days you lose followers, other days you gain them, whatever. I was training this guy. I put his results up. His friend, Heron Preston, who's still one of my boys today, DM'd me like, yo, I'd love to come work out. I saw what you did for this guy. I, I, you know, I think I have a similar body type. I'd love to come. Mm -hmm. You know, Heron comes working out. He gets in good ass shape. We were putting in work. Virgil sees this. He's like, yo, like, what are you doing? Like, what's going on? Virgil emails me. Uh, yeah, Heron puts me on an email with Virgil. Virgil's like, yo, I want to come in. And I'm like, pull up. Mm. I had no idea. This is the key thing. I had no idea who Virgil was also. Mm. I mean, I kind of knew of him, but yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. And this is early, right before he really took off. He comes in, has a, has a good workout. He's like, shoots me another email. He's Joe, that was great. Uh, could I come back tomorrow? You know, here's my number. Hit me. I'm like, yeah, sick. Pull up. And, you know, we formulated a friendship off of that. The next day he comes in, like we end up going to Made in America together. He invited me down to, after the workout. We pull up, we squat. And that builds on top of each other, right? Because then from there, 
I'm putting in his work, documenting it. Friends start connecting you. Uh, people start reaching out to you. And the Naomi thing, how I got, uh, how I got Naomi was because Ricardo Tishi, uh, was one of my clients too. He was a former head of Bur Burberry. We're working out and how he's like, yo, I have this dinner later, pull up. And I'm like, all right. Cause he's releasing his Nike thing. Yeah. And I didn't want to go. It was a long ass day, but I'm like, come on, you got to support your people. Just show up. I show up there. Virgil's there. Ricardo Tishi's there. And this guy, Derek Blasberg's there. Who I also have another story for in a second, which is interesting, but I'm there. And all of them are like, Naomi, you got to work out with Joe. Mm. And she's like, oh, I don't really work out. You know, that type of thing. They're like, no, you got to work out with Joe. Mm. And then she's like, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. Text me. I'm like, I don't think she's going to show up. Mm. And she showed up and I, you know, we created a relationship. She enjoyed the workouts we built. And it's really, all, it's of course, about, it's about knowing your stuff, of course, having a good personality, but also showing up. Like people don't realize I was in the gym putting in 12 hour days, I, more 15 hour days, some days working from six to nine, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Hmm. Pushing, pushing, pushing. But then again, that's the base, those small catalyst moments, right? Hmm. That, that's the crazy catch. Those are my San Antonio Holmes moments, right? Hmm. When my friend Liv Perez, who was living with Bella Hadid at the time, uh, Perez wanted me to come work out. Bella comes down. She starts working out too. You know, this is when VS was, stuff was still big. She, you know, then goes back up, tells Olivia for that, you know, Joe's my guy. And we worked out for, you know, two, three years and just established a friendship, you know? Mm -hmm. And then of course it's on me to continuously develop and, and, and things like that. But a lot of my successes have been through a few things, just condensing, condensing, condensing it down. One, people ask for the secret sauce. There is no, the secret sauce is you. You got to figure out what makes you special. Two, mm -hmm. it's a service industry. So figure out what are the things that you can provide to that other person for, for best results. And then they'll end up seeing something in you, right? So Virgil gave me more chances. He then allowed me to work on the creative side, mm -hmm. right? Which was special, right? And then, you know, showing up for Naomi, whether that was going to different countries, whether that was showing up, you know, super early and God bless her, but she was always a little late, love her though. But doing all that <laughs> was constantly showing up. Yeah. And, you know, Paris is an, another quick one, was the fact that I started to work for Nike. Uh, group training was big at the time. I said, yeah, I can do the group training stuff. But as a former athlete, I'm more used to the semi-private model. How do I get you to an end result? Hmm. So I've talked to Nike and I wanted to, you know, create the bridge between running and training. But I also wanted to help them build out their concierge service, hmm. which was traveling along to all the different fashion weeks, right? At the time, training, whatever, media, influencers, models, that type of thing. My boy, Derek, who's now my boy, Derek Blasberg, Nike connected me with him because he wanted a trainer. He didn't really wasn't really getting along with other people. He took a liking to me, right? Mm. And then you know what happened? He would have a book release. He asked me to show up. I showed up. Now we start to formulate a friendship. And now he's he plugged me into the fashion world because my first trip to Paris was because I trained him and Barbara Bush for a half marathon. Nike said we don't have the budget to send Joe. Derek. And Barbara said, well, if Joe's not there, we don't really want to run it. Mm. They, what could he could have done? They could have just said, oh, we're not going to run. You know what Derek did? He bought my ticket to Paris. Mm. He used his points, bought me to Paris. I'm now in Paris. And what did that also allow me to do? That allowed me to keep tr training people that were there, both for Nike and to create and to do my job, but also foster re the, those relationships. He bet on me. Mm. You can't let people down that bet on you. Mm. And then from there, you keep going. And there's other stuff. Nike also, did, or other work, perhaps, you know, I maxed out credit cards some years ago to Paris because I had to train these, I had to train these women for the VS show. There wasn't a way for me to get there at first, but I got, I paid my way there. Nike ends up giving me work while I'm there, but mm -hmm. I had to figure out the rest of this stuff. Where's a hotel at that I could, Paris gyms are so hard. Where's a hotel at mm -hmm. that I can train at that has a gym? Now I know I got to put myself up. This was early in my career. I said, fuck it. It's just an investment itself. I had, to, I had to stay at one of the most expensive hotels in Paris. I had to max out my credit cards. And mm -hmm. I said, I'll figure this out. I max out my credit cards. I paid for my boy to come, right? Because he was also there to help me out, to assist, to document the, document the whole thing, right? While I'm there, I end up getting work, ends up paying for itself. It's fine. 
I'm also able to document it. People at the time weren't doing that. I'm able to maintain my relationship with my clients. And then, it, then what happens the next year after I bet on myself? Now, Nike pays for me to go. They find me the gym. Mm -hmm. They set the whole thing up. And then another year, I get a deal with Beats. Beats pays for me to be there. We get my clients in, all that type of thing. So I'm not, you know, I'm rambling a little bit, but all that to say is there's a, there's a story behind the hustle, but again, it's those small moments that, that definitely add up. And a lot of people just think, you know, it just happened. Mm. It didn't. You had, you know, people bet on me and then, you know, I, I, I placed a couple bets on myself that ended up working out and really surveyed the industry where I thought that it would make sense. And now I'm at the stage where, you know, I got to, I have that foundation I've been able to do the good work. I've been, I have the necessary things behind my name. It's just continue to develop. So, yeah, but it was a slog, man. It was, you know, I was, I was naive, but at the same time, I put in the work that was necessary for me to get to where I am. Mm. No, I love hearing it. I love hearing it. And the reason why is because um, that's what success looks like. Um, I remember there's a quote from Steve Jobs that you can, you can never connect the dots looking um, you can only connect the dots looking backwards, never forwards. Yeah. And that's the, that's the difficult part about it. Because um, when you're giving out those, those health bars, when you're showing up early, you're doing 15 hours in the gym. Yeah. When you're showing up for the dinner and you don't feel like it. When you're maxing out the credit card in Paris, the guarantee of success is not there. Nah. You're not doing something knowing that it's going to lead to this direct result. And because of that, it takes grit. It takes grit. That's the word that comes to mind for me. And what I want to know from you, and I think it will be powerful for the audience, is when you're in those moments that require grit, that require you to kind of double down, and it's self-belief as well, right? That something better is going to happen in the future from me doing this now. And even though I can't see it, I have the faith to believe it. I want to know have you ever been, what were the moments where you were disillusioned, number one? And then two, in those moments where you're disillusioned, when things are tough, when grit is required, what is motivating you? What is, what is making that split, that split second decision, I'm going to show up for the workout tomorrow. I'm going to go to the dinner. What, what is that? What is, where is the grit emerging from? It's a doggy dog world, man. You, I look at it as if if if, if I'm not going to take that spot, somebody else is. Mm. I was some at the end of the day, somebody coming for me, right? And if I have that door open for me, and I get too comfortable and think that I could, that door will always be there, and you do not step through it, it will shut. It will shut because mm. the faster you become relevant, the faster you become irrelevant. And then you also have to think about if my. I also just think about it like this. If that was my dinner and I invited my friend there and I did not show up and he, they did not show up, how would I feel? I'm very big on supporting your friends. That, mm. That's the biggest thing for me. So to me, a lot of it is just service. And I, and I don't see these people as celebrities. I see them as human. If they want to mm. work out with me, I take, I, 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 I take that, you know, I don't take that lightly. They want to spend time with me, right? And, but it also can help improve them. Mm. That's, the best, that's the best of both worlds. But those moments when you're more so making a business decision, should I go? Should I not go? Should I do this? Should I do that? You have to also survey the landscape to see if it makes sense, right? So if I'm going to go to Paris, all right, I had to evaluate, are there people there that I've been working with that I know I could work with there, right? But are they asking me if I'm going to be there? Hmm. They would ask me. I would have no plans on being there. They asked me if I'd be there. I'd be like, yeah, probably, right? Build it. See it. So now I'm, I'm able to create real-time market research. I'm surveying the landscape. Mm. Are there people there that are interested with the service that I have to provide, right? And then can I anchor that on onto somebody else that I already work with, say Nike? If I go there, can I also help Nike in a way since I'll be there anyway? Mm. Probably, right? So I'm like, all right, more likely than not, I will... It will, be, it will likely be successful, right? Mm. And then if it won't be, that's totally fine. Then people just forget about it anyway. But if, the, if there's a higher upside, so a lot of it is just is performing a SWOT analysis, right? S super rudimentary old school. 
strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Mm. Really quick. If it makes sense, go do it, right? If it doesn't, then don't. But that's how you turn uncertainty into risk. You can manage risk. Mm. You can't manage uncertainty because you haven't measured anything. Mm. So I was able to take the uncertainty of the situation, create a a risk management uh, profile, and see the relation between downside and upside. And the upside for those situations, which I bet was always a little bit more clear. Um, So that's really, that's, that's how I approach it. We can now, it's become a situation of more so uh, prove, before it was prove it. Now it's just do it. Now I have the ability to, I've I've fostered enough proof of concept and belief. But to your point is what we talked about earlier. It's you are able to double down when you take emotion out of certain situations to create realism, right? Mm -hmm. It's that now I've been able to measure it enough where I'm not basing this just off of gut feeling, even if the gut feeling was telling me to do something. I'm, I'm, I'm basing it now off of the possible validity of the situation. Mm. And when you mix intuition and validity, there's no way you lose. Mm. It's, very, it's very unlikely you'll lose. Let's mm. put it like that. You won't lose big. You might have a you know, micro failure. But that's, how I, that's really how I looked at it. And I think I have the ability to do that internally very, very well. And to be able to be honest with how I how I view and approach situations, uh, but a lot of it comes down to service and support. These people are my friends; they're humans. I just want to support. I, I, that's just, that was that was me. I would support my friends, and that opens up opportunities because uh, people want to you know help other people that are not just good at what they do, but also that like that they like and have been supporting them. So, yeah, that's you know that's how I approached it. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like whenever you start speaking, there's so many, there's so many powerful things that you you say in like that. <laughs> Damn the 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 turning uncertainty into risk. Like it's um obviously I record these episodes. There's certain things that I take outside of the episode that like that's gonna be on my mind, and I can I can see that one. Um, and the story is inspirational, and I think it's inspirational because um, it's like incredible. But like also because people can see where you are now. Um, you got to talk your shit. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing I tell young folks. There's a video Tyler Creator talks about this, but he's like, if you've worked so hard, whether that's on a song or an idea or a book or whatever, and you're not like self-promoting in any way mm. or just telling the story. It's one of the best things that Virgil told me. He was like, if essentially you don't tell your retell those stories and tell your own story, somebody else would tell it for you. So you have yeah. to be able to define, essentially define yourself. And be able to control the narrative. But mm-hmm. if you're just controlling the narrative in a way that's just documentation, that's why I respect what he did so much and archiving and all those type of things. If you're not going to, sh- and there's so many people out there who are afraid to show their work because it's not as illustrious as it should be yet, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, you don't get to those points where you do the illustrious things. You know, you don't get the features in Vogue. You don't get the master class. You don't, if you're not telling your story. Mm-hmm. So that's my biggest thing. It's like, tell your story and upskill 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 you know when you invite me on for this podcast like i've never met you before right Mm. and out of respect you're a young black kid trying to come up i would want somebody to say yes to me too Mm. right but i looked at your page and you had recently just uh done an interview with the dude i can't he's a relatively big guy he has a Mm. he's a he's a big platform he's he I don't remember his podcast, but he had done some some stuff with tim grover and a bunch of other kobe other big players in the space and i was like okay Mm. He did something with him. It looks rather legit. Let's give him a shot, right? Yeah. But what if you didn't put that out? What if you mm. weren't telling your story, right? Mm. So that's what I'm. T- that's what the thing is. It's you know, I don't know. It's cliche, but you know, everybody thinks it's just a straight to Z, mm. you know, and it's not. And it, you got to sh- you if you got to show every letter of the alphabet, show some show show some words that you might have thrown out that don't mm. even fucking exist anymore, right? Yeah. That you try to take from another language and put into your own design language. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's what it is. It's, you know, if you're really out here trying to make a lane for yourself and you are not figuring out the best way to tell your own story, control your narrative and make it helpful. Yeah. I don't know how you survive. Yeah. You know, I like um, one of the things we spoke about at the start was like the base. We've kind of spoken about it throughout. And even when you say that, it's like, um, I think, why don't people do that? Why don't people tell their story? And I think what it was for me in the past and what it is for other people is the bar is just too damn high. They, the bar for them to put something out, they're like, I'm, 
what I'm doing is unremarkable. Um, it needs to be more spectacular. Maybe when I make it, then I can start sharing more. Um, sometimes you need to bring the bar down. And I think now more than ever, you know, it's funny. We even, I even talk about this um, with Chris, like our producer. Like if you think about documentaries, like even the big ones on Netflix, a lot of the times the moments that you like the most are like um, when the person they're interviewing is like coming into shot and sitting down. Yeah, or like yeah. maybe they're saying something offhand to someone. It's like people want the authentic shit. Yeah. They want the shit that's not, oh, I was at this like incredible dinner and there were like a hundred cameras. They want what happened when all the cameras were off. Yeah, yeah. That's what I want to hear. Like that's what people, that's what people tune in for, the real shit, because then they feel like they really know you. They could really feel it. So like, no, I 100% agree with it. Like you have to, you have to share your story. Um, and to be honest, I'm glad that we got you on because it's like, <laughs> it's a fucking inspiring story. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you though, one of the things I was thinking about even before this, I was like, who motivates the motivator? And here's what I mean by that. Um, maybe like six months ago, I had like a, like a personal trainer and you schedule this time with your personal trainer and sometimes you're up for it, right? Like you're like, okay, I'm ready to kill this workout. Sometimes you look on your calendar, you've had a long ass day. You see the, the appointment with the personal trainer. You're like, bro, I can't be bothered for this shit. Like I ain't, like, I ain't trying to do this shit. And um, it was funny. I was actually watching one of the videos you had on your YouTube and it was with Naomi Campbell. And she was saying that like, um, she never used to like working out before she started working out with you. And it brought this phrase to my mind. I was like, who motivates the motivator? So like um, a lot of, for a lot of people, their personal trainer is almost like it's motivating to them. It gets them to do the thing. Yeah. And so I was like, I want to know like who motivates you? Like who motivates the motivator? I mean, uh, it's just believe, uh, people believe in me. You don't want to let them down. And mm. uh, you know, that, that of course motivates me. I don't have, you know, I read a lot. So people in history that have been through a lot worse than me motivate me. Uh, you know, my ancestors, the lineage we've been through, people that have, have been able, I'm not trying to get into identity politics, but at the end, things of course could be better, but what other time in history was there been a benefit to being a black man in America? What's better, honestly, what's better than now? Mm. Probably nothing, right? So why am I going to waste that point complaining and not fulfilling my potential? The sacrifice my parents made, the sacrifice people I don't even know of made, Right. And that what motivates me is because I look at it like this. Like I think if you're lower, if you're lower middle class and above, before you get like super rich, you've basically been born in a purgatory. So you've won a lottery. I've been given a chance. Mm. That motivates me. The fact that I was given a chance. I was first off two months, two plus months premature. So who know? I wasn't even supposed to make it. Mm. Now in modern times, at any other time in history, I'd probably be dead. I got a shot, right? Mm. And my family has made sacrifices. All these people have made sacrifices. I have decent acumen. I'm a decent looking guy. I've, and I've had been bestowed opportunities. And then I have the ability to improve people's health, mm. which is crazy. Like I, I have the ability to help people have a slice of heaven on earth. That's what I look at. We're in, we're, uh, whatever people believe in. I, I think to an extent, hell is on earth. Some people have been born into hell. And that mm. shit fucking sucks. You've mm. been born into a situation and no matter what you do or how you work, you're not getting out of it. Mm. Other, and whether that is mentally and emotionally or that's actually through, through the situation built around you within culture, right? Mm. The country you live in, those type of things. I've essentially been put into purgatory, as I alluded to earlier. And if I get help lead people out of that purgatory and have their mm. little slice of heaven on earth, that's what motivates me. That's mm. what gets me going. I don't, I'm not motivated by really me. I'm motivated by the opportunities that I have. And I don't want to waste that. And I also just love reading. I love history. I love, uh, that's the stuff that I love. But it's, I mean, sometimes I wish I was motivated by money, but I'm not. Sometimes, you know, I was, I, I was you know, that, that Michael Jordan energy where I just have that chip in my shoulder, but I don't. Uh, even though I do have to make up stories for myself sometimes. But I'm just motivated by the chance that I have. And sometimes I just... I, I just wake up and I look around. I'm like, I'm in fucking New York. I may, I may, you know, when you 
crossing that bridge from Brooklyn into the city. It's always mm. super romantic, whether you're on a train or a car, whether it's sunset, whatever. You see the city driving by. And I'm like, holy shit, dog. I've made something of myself in this fucking city. Mm. And that's not because of just me. That's because of the belief that other people have in me. So what motivates me, I'm like, damn. There's somebody who wakes up and chooses to look at my Twitter, who chooses to look at my Instagram and says, I'm rooting for Joe. I'm rooting for Joe. I don't mm. want to let them down. Mm. I don't want to let them down. And that, you know, that inspires me and keeps me going. And you know, just helping people find their freedom. That's mm. all. That's really what it is. Um, so I guess I don't have distinct individuals. I mean, the only person I really looked up to was Virgil. That's the only, per- that's the only person I would ever thought of working for. That was the only, per- the only person. He was my North Star. Of course, my dad and stuff, but you know, that that's that was that that was it. So yeah, what motivates me to change is the chance that I have and the, and the help that I could give. Hmm. Now that's special. I'm curious why um, why Virgil? What was it about him that was so um, that stood out? Because you've been you've been around some like remarkable individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was special about him? Uh. I mean, he just led with love. It was like he, 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 was, he was never too busy. He was never too cocky. He was never too tired. He, he, he would always help. But this fact that he was an expert generalist, like he was balancing so many different things and so many different aspects of his design practice and being able to see somebody do that and go from, you know, a DJ to the head of LV and still do off-white, do this, do that, go give a talk, design a chair, that type of thing. Having all those spokes to, spokes to the wheel inspired me. And, you know, that's what, yeah. I mean, there's just, sometimes you just see similarities in, in people. And you also just see the work that they're putting in. And that the, the ability to show you that there, there are more ways and more options. So his, his work process and just how kind he was was super inspiring to me. Hmm. You know, um, and here's where I want to finish. Um, one of the things just listening to you that you've said is um, just like people that believed in you, uh, people that gave you opportunities, um, people that trusted that you could deliver. Mm. And I can just tell from the emotion and how you say it, you feel that deeply. It's, um, it's very motivating for you. And one of the things I believe is that people are motivated by different things. Um, some people are just motivated, they just by themselves. Some people get more motivated when other people um, have given them opportunity or have put them in a certain spot. And so I kind of just want you to be like, in, um, like introspective with it. Why, do you, why is it such a strong feeling when it's like someone has believed in me? Like, why does that, why does that give you the, the feeling um, and the emotion that like, I need to deliver because this person believed. Where does that start? Why is that such a powerful thing for you? I mean, I think as an athlete growing up, you know, when you are that person on a team or you get that shot, you never want to let your teammates down. I also think it stems from from the fact that I I was high achieving as a youth, but nobody told me that. So nobody told me I was good, even though I was doing remarkable things, right? So whether that was being at the top of my class or that being a junior Olympian, or maybe I you know, was just weighing two things, the negative things too heavily on my mind. So one of the things that I wish that I would have had as a kid was just peep, somebody pulling me aside and being like, Joe, you're good at what it is that you do, but let's help make you better, right? Mm-hmm. Let's help, you know, the more of the cultivating coaching style. Let's get you to that next level because I, I think a lot of people took my, my anxiety for arrogance. So growing up, I always had, you know, coaches talk shit, like, you should be so much better. You should be doing this. Or you should be doing that. Or, you know, you just think you're a prima donna or whatever. I mean, it's just like, I'm trying my best. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing is actually as good, that good, even if it was. I think I just got ahead a lot on my talent and my charisma. So then entering the adult world, and then people are like, you notice that, you, you just notice the energy that somebody gives you when they actually believe in you, when they want you to be able to do something well. So I think a lot of it comes from that, you know, that childhood self of mine where, you know, I just have respect for people that believed in me because, you know, that was something I didn't have early on with my college coach, Coach Rick, who 
fucking believed in me, even after all my injuries, made sure I played, put, you know, was always in my corner with, you know, always knew that I could step up, you know, and that moving into adulthood where somebody says, I want you to do this job. And also as I said, the athlete mindset is that you don't want to let, let them down. Like you want, you want to, you want to make the big play. You want to be able to give an exhale at the end of the day and say, yeah, I did that. Hmm. Like, I did that. So whether it's, you know, people at Nike who, you know, helped elevate me just outside of the trainer role and would allow me to help creative direct events and experiences, would allow me to help do that on campaigns, would allow me to help, you know, crafting and and and, and curate wellness immersion experiences. Hmm. You, when you get those shots, you don't want to let people down because you don't know another one's going to come again. Hmm. But I think a lot of it just stems from that childhood, Joe. And I'm I'm fine if that's one of my traumas or that's something that I got to continue to work through. Then I'm just going to work my ass off to prove people right just because child Joe didn't get enough of that or mm-hmm. wasn't, you know, didn't feel like he had people in his corner. Shit, if that's a trauma I got to deal with in my life, I'm totally cool with that. But, you know, I think I've continued to develop and grow out of that. But one of the biggest things is belief, because if you you have faith you have faith in something that is also real. So that means that you are putting essentially aspirational godlike qualities on something. If you believe they will deliver, mm. no matter how hard or difficult it is, you'll know they'll be there and you that you take that weight off your mind. I don't want to put that weight back on people's mind, you know? And I want to be known for doing good work. My name is my name. Mm. My name now means something. You know how crazy mm. that is? Mm. There are a lot of people, there's a lot of names out there. But if somebody says Joe Holder, oh, they know. They know. If you Google me, you know who I am mm. because I did the motherfucking work because people believed in me. So, you know, my name is my name. My lineage is my lineage. And you, I want my name to hold weight. And, you know, that's that's what I'll, you know, continue to strive for. Mm. That's powerful. That's one of the most powerful things is that when people hear your name, that's that's like your reputation. Yeah. That's the ultimate form of reputation is your name. Um, do you feel misunderstood now? Uh, I mean, that always depends, man. I don't, that depends on how, understanding how people, I guess, understand me. I don't, I don't always feel misunderstood. I think I've been able to craft a, a true narrative a little bit that shows the full, that shows the full sides of me. Uh, but I just want to be known as, as like, you know, whatever, a creative director of wellness in the space, like a modern health theorist. And it's on people to to think what they think of me, but at the end of the day, the people that know that the people that want to know know, and the people that should know know. Mm. So, um, it's not really just being about you know misunderstood. It's just continuing to develop my own story and help help people understand me in a full way. So instead of being you know, I used to be upset sometimes about that, be like, oh, you know, I don't get enough credit or I'm misunderstood mm. that type of thing. Instead of thinking it now more as an opportunity. If how do I create a more robust ecosystem that people can understand my story to also see more of themselves in situations that they should so that they can improve their health. So, you know, I, I, I can't be the Miami LeBron. LeBron, my LeBron couldn't be the Miami LeBron because that shit weighs on your heart. You it'll help you for a couple of years. But but playing and playing the game, you know, the sport of life with that that fucking always heavy heaviness cold-blooded assassin mentality you can't it, it'll it'll eat you alive mm. and instead you see the opportunity in it right lebron went back to cleveland and won the championship right mm. he fulfilled that he closed the gap you know and you continue to upskill it and move on instead of i think you know holding on to too much angst which which is never good yeah it's funny um i remember hearing a joke about jordan on a podcast because um Obviously, everyone always talks about like the chip on the shoulder with Jordan and like he would make up these things in his head and like um, even certain people in the media. I think the reason that uh, his relationship with Charles Barkley kind of uh, dissolved is because he said something about him while he was like in the media and stuff. And there was this comedian. He was just joking. He's like, he's like, look at Jordan's eyes. Like you can tell that guy holds on to everything. Like look in his eyes. Like the motherfucker's always red. Like that'll age you fast. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's tough, but sometimes you have to let it go. You have to let things go, uh, but it can be difficult. Um, but nah, man, yeah. I love, uh, I love that note to end it on. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's been a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the channel. 
We're having fire conversations every week on the podcast. Before we end the episode, a quick word from our sponsor, Free Agency. What if I told you there is a good chance you're leaving money on the table in your career? It would kind of annoy you a bit, right? Well, Free Agency aims to stop that. They represent and manage talent in the tech industry. Here's how they do it. First, they provide you with a dedicated talent agent. Think about this as your career quarterback. They understand you and your career goals. Based on that understanding, they bring you suitable interviews at top firms. You focus on smashing the interview and together with their network, research, negotiation expertise, they will make sure you get a top of market salary. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with free agency.